Okay, so let's um, consider an experiment, a typical high energy physics experiment in which uh, we collide um, a part, a beam of particles with another beam of particles. Okay, and see what the outcome is. So what I'm going to do is I will start by colliding one particle with a bunch of particles and then ask the probability of producing a particular final state and then we will add up uh, all these probabilities to, to determine what is the total probability of finding a particular final state. Okay? So a typical setup is like this. Um, I should draw here. So this is the z axis okay so the, along this direction you fire a particle let's say the particle that you are firing is a, going to move in this direction and i will label it as k2 so the momentum of this is k2 okay and i'm not going to assume that um I am working only with scalar fields. Okay, uh, whatever I say here is general, it applies to any theory. Though I will tell you where the differences will come, but the expressions that I give in this in this lecture will be applicable to um, to any theory. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether it doesn't um, cause any a hindrance that we have only studied phi four interaction um, um, real scalar fields in this in this course. Okay, so that's the direction of the projectile. So you project it towards um, a beam of particles. So I will show it like this. Okay, so you have lots of particles here. You can assume them to be stationary, but you don't have to. Okay, this is okay. Fine. So this this is perpendicular to the z-axis. Maybe it will be better if I draw it a little bit like this. Okay, now it looks perpendicular. Okay, so you have this beam, it has some thickness. So you have also, okay. So it's basically, okay, sorry for my bad drawing. So it has some thickness. Okay, so this is along the z direction now. Okay, so basically, I'm trying to draw the following. This, this, this denotes the thickness, and this is how it looks. Okay. Um, so let's say the thickness is L. So this thing is L, and I have written already. This is Z. This is x direction and the perpendicular direction is y direction. Okay. Can okay, you have all these particles here? So what do we do? We take this projectile of momentum k2 and collide it with this this beam. Okay. And this is what happens to clean LHC experiments. So there, um, not only this one will be a single particle, but it will also be a bunch. So you'll have a bunch coming from left, a bunch coming from right, and they will collide. So let's label a, uh, let's take a particle of some particle here, okay, which is inside the, inside this uh, beam, and let's say its coordinate is B. Okay. 
so this position vector here is the origin this position vector i call b so i'm looking at this particular particle so b is equal to it has these components b1 b2 and b3 okay which i will write as so b1 and b2 together i will call as b perpendicular and then we have b3 okay and b has dimensions of length because we are looking at this coordinate space okay b is the coordinate of the particle in the uh, in the in the physical space okay and b perpendicular this vector which is basically the component of b vector in the xy plane okay perpendicular to the direction of collision that is what i am talking about so b perpendicular is defined as impact parameter okay or or the magnitude of this is defined as the impact parameter okay so first we will look at collision of projectile with a particle located at at b2 okay so uh, what we should do is first we should construct the wave functions okay and for k2 and also for the particle located at b and for the particle located at k2 uh, located here sorry not at k2 here okay and um, that's what i do so the wave function the the state i will denote as f2 for this one and as before f2 is d cube k2 prime over 2 omega k2 prime that's what we have done in previous lecture so here is the smearing function okay so k2 prime is dummy of course and this f2 tilde is peaked around k2 okay so when you integrate over k2 prime it will pick up a value uh, close to k2 okay in the vicinity of k2 this is non zero otherwise it's almost zero so that's the overlapping function uh, sorry smearing function k2 and this axis is k2 prime okay so this is your f2 tilde sorry something happened does not even do and do f2 tilde k2 okay i don't know how i got this so that's projectile and the target particle which is located at b i will write the state as f1 b okay so that label b tells you that i am talking about this particle located at b so you have d cube k1 prime f1 tilde k1 prime and then this momentum state k1 prime okay now in this beam which looks very ugly here should have drawn it neatly but uh, in this beam okay all these particles we can um, for them we can choose the wave function of them this f1 tilde or the coordinate space uh, uh, function which you obtain by doing a fourier transform all of them to be uh, having the same form so let's say if i'm looking at all these particles in the beam then let's say this is the one at location b if this is the wave function of this one in the coordinate space then for this one it has identical one and this one also has identical one and so forth and also for all the others other ones also within this 
within the slab within the slab of these particles okay we will assume that they all have are described by the wave function which look identical okay so that's a choice we can make no harm if you make a different choice provided you are still uh, localizing these particles properly so we'll but how we will make that a simplifying choice so particles in beam in the in the beam they have um, wave functions or the smearing functions identical smearing functions okay they looks the same that's what i mean so if you have a uh, let's say look at x equal to 0 okay the the particle which is located here at the origin okay so right now you should be um, okay so this particle at the origin which is at x equal to 0 okay the target particle one of the target particles so let's write its um, yeah the the smearing function for it for it or the wave function for it let's call it f1 x okay so this envelope which i made this one is given by f1 x for this particle here okay and then we have another one here we should find out what it should be okay that one so if i look at a particle located at x equal to b then its wave function would be given by f1 b of x that's the notation i am using okay and what is this function so if you take this f1 of x okay whatever that function is it goes to zero and take this entire function okay and transport it to the location b that's what you have to do so you take this function and move it and put it where the point b is so instead of the peak being located at x equal to 0 it you take this entire thing and move so that the peak is located at x equal to b and how do you do that well that's equivalent to um, changing the coordinate to uh, shifting the coordinate to uh, by an amount minus b okay so f1 this functional form then becomes f1 of x minus b okay when you shift the entire thing to b it's equivalent to changing the coordinate and shifting it by minus b okay so that is why you get this functional form so fun now i know the function f1b in terms of the function which i had uh, the wave function which i had written down for the particle located at x equal to 0 okay and um, we can also calculate now what will be f1 tilde b k1 so if you take a fourier transform here and it gives you f1 tilde k1 okay then what is the corresponding fourier transform if you uh, look at this function and that's easy you have um, d cube x over 2 pi 3 halves f 1 b x e to the minus i k 1 dot x ok that's just the Fourier transform but this object is f 1 of x minus b ok so now I will do a uh, shift in the uh, in the variable and I will write 
so um, I will write x prime equal to x minus b. Okay, so this becomes f one of x prime, which I'm again writing as x, and this will gives you this will give you e to the minus i k perpendicular. Okay, and um, sorry, b dot uh, that's what I want to write b dot k perpendicular, and then minus i y sorry not perpendicular it's one I am sorry k1 dot x and then you have d cube x over 2 pi 3 halves okay all I have done is change a change the variable and this is a constant factor it comes out b dot k1 times f1 tilde k1 so you see the the effect of um, this translation of this uh, functions is merely a phase factor that is picked up. Okay, so you just pick up a phase factor when you look at the Fourier transform. Okay, so good that also we know, which means that f one b this ket the state I will write as integral d cube k one prime e1 prime so let's record it here e to the minus i b dot k1 um, f1 tilde k1 prime so there should be a prime here and k1 prime this kit okay we will use this later so, um, now recall that even though the in and out state, the basis states which we had um, uh, defined in terms of which we construct all the, all the other states, okay, uh, we could normalize them only to, uh, only up to delta functions, right? We could only normalize them to delta functions. So, here, um, let us see somewhere here. Okay, like here. These were because of the delta functions, right? But now because I am smearing it out, there is a finite momentum range. I can unite, um, not unite. I can normalize these um, states to unity. Okay, that's what I will do. But I should first pause the recording. Okay. So, what I was saying, yeah, yeah. So, um, unlike the in and out states, which we use as basis state, which can only be normalized to delta functions, we can normalize these states: this f one b or uh, ket f two or this ket f one b. These states to unity because these are not states of um, definite momentum okay these are spread out the momentum is spread out so i can i can normalize them to unity so here is the normalization so right now i'm looking these as single particle states right you have one particle which is coming and it's far away from every other thing so i can construct a single particle state there's another one which is in the bunch but also it's highly localized so i can also um, construct a single particle state for that. So, we will normalize these states. And the normalization is ok and similarly F 2 Okay. Now let's see um, what is the consequence, what is the requirement that we should satisfy if we want this normalization. 
So, what is F 1? F 1 is or, or let us say F 2. F 2 is this. Okay. So, when I put a bra F 2 okay, next to it, I will have another factor of F 2 and I should use a different argument let us say K 2 double prime. Okay. And then you will have bra k 2 double prime get k 2 prime okay. and that is what is going to give you a delta function okay, with a factor of uh, 2 omega k 2 prime. Okay. So, let us do that with a factor of um, yes that is correct with that factor and we will have two such factors because one such factor over 1 over omega k 2 prime will come from from this integral and from the corresponding bra integral you will have 1 over 2 omega k 2 double prime. But then this delta function that you get from here will force both the omega k 2s to have to be uh, omega k 2 prime. Okay. So, let us do that. So, f 2 f 2 um, will be equal to d cube k 2 prime over 2 m omega k 2 prime times f 1 tilde sorry f 2 tilde k 2 prime mod square. Okay, and this by this condition is 1. So, let me just tell you how that has happened. So, here when you look at the corresponding bra, so f 2 this one, this will be what d cube k 2 double prime over 2 omega k 2 double prime f 2 tilde k 2 double prime but then you will have a complex conjugate right you are uh, the um, these these coefficients they get conjugated when you go from ket to bra so you have this and k2 double prime okay and then i'm using k1 double prime um, sorry k2 double prime k2 prime is equal to 2 omega k 2 prime delta cube k 2 double prime minus k 2 prime. Okay, that is what I have used. So, when, when you put all these things together, you get this condition. Okay. So, this is the condition that has to be satisfied on the smearing uh, that uh, should be satisfied by the smearing function. Okay. So, you should take f tilde 2 such that if you were to mod square it and divide by 2 omega k 2 prime okay, and then integrate over you should get 1. And of course, similar argument will give you the following. There is no need for putting these primes here. I could just leave them out, but I will still keep. So, these are the conditions to be satisfied by the smearing functions. Okay, good. So, what is it that we want to ask in the experiment? Okay, what we want to ask is given this state, given the two particle state, the initial two particle state where which is uh, given by um, f 1, f 2, sorry which one I am calling 2, which one 1, f 1. Okay. So, uh, F1B 
and F2. The, the one in the beam I am calling F1 and the one in the one which is the projectile I am calling F2. So, this one, so you have a two particle state, an initial two particle state which is this. Okay, let us put in for initial. So, question is what is the probability that such a state which includes these two particles which are going to collide evolves to a, a state, a final state. Okay, I am right now thinking in terms of uh, in, in, in the Schrodinger picture, okay, but you understand uh, these are of course constructed in, in the Heisenberg picture, but the, the way I am speaking is uh, the way you would speak in Schrodinger picture. Okay, but I think I would I believe that you understand what I am saying. So, this in state gives you a state which has n particles in the final state. Okay. So, that is the question that we want to ask. What is the probability of such an event? Ideally, I should not even uh, put um, this basis state here, I should put some smearing functions for each of them and then ask what is the probability of producing this final state, right? where g 1 will be peaked around p 1 and g n will be peaked around g tilde n will be peaked around p n, but I will not uh, um, do that thing. I will just say that I am sorry, I am looking at the probability of producing this okay because the the effect of putting the smearing functions i will carefully keep in this um, in the next steps and then you will see that at the end these smearing functions just disappear from the calculation so then you can also believe that you know even in this case these g tildes will disappear so for at least for this part for the out part i will just keep this um, these labels as momentum labels instead of the smearing functions. Okay, but if you want, you can put this g one tilde, uh, g two tilde, etc. So let me nevertheless write down that if you were to, if you really wish, then you could do this. So this will be your g one tilde, e one prime. Okay or P 1, yeah P 1 prime. So, it will pick up the momentum at P 1. Okay, so, that is what we want to ask and uh, it is immediately clear that the moment you ask this thing, the, the quantity that probability will be vanishingly small, right? because what you are asking is given this state what is the probability that I get particle which has momentum precisely p 1, another particle which has momentum precisely p 2 and that and so forth and the nth one has momentum precisely p n. Okay. If you are so precise with uh, these requirements, if you are so specific with these requirements, then most of the events that you produce are not going to fall into this category. Okay. Most of them will have some moment, momentum where the particle one particle has momentum different from p i mean none of them is same as p1 none of the same none of them has momentum as p2 so that will be vanishingly small or an inf infinitesimal um, quantity so it would make sense that we ask some probability of an event which has a finite um, a finite probability associated to it okay so that's what i will do so, as I argued just now that if you were to ask the probability that f 1 b sorry f 1 b f 2 this state okay, giving you these momenta p 1 to p n okay, the probability is given by mod, m, uh, mod square then this will be infinitesimally small. Right? Because it is just uh, almost impossible to produce exactly that configuration with exact those momenta in the final state. Okay? There will be, it will be 0. So, 
what we should ask instead is that I want the final state particles okay, which are produced after the collision to have not momentum P1 but some moment uh, they should have okay so what i precisely mean is i will count the event as an event which i am looking for if one of the particles has a momentum which lies in a region r1 another particle has a mom has momenta has momentum which lies in the region r2 r3 and so forth okay that's something i can ask okay where sorry rn where this is some some region not in physical space but momentum space okay so if an event occurs and the particle has you measure the momentum of the particle and the particle has a momentum which is lying somewhere here you count it as uh, okay, so let's say event number one. So you collide uh, these initial state particles, and it produces a final state where the particle has one of the particles has momentum, which is here. Another one has momentum here. Another one has momentum here, and, uh, and so forth here. So that counts as an event because the momenta lies in this region. I collide another one, uh, another bunch of particles. Um, Okay, in the initial state and suppose this time one of the particles has momentum here another one has in here third one has in here and fourth one uh, another one here this is not counted right because the momentum is outside so i am going to add up all those event events in finding out the probability in for which these particles fall in this region and this region can be big okay i am not assuming that this momentum region is small it can be big doesn't have to be a small region okay i don't care whether uh, where it falls in within this region it can be a big region okay and in principle not in principle i can do the following that i take uh, the region r1 to be the entire momentum region oops to be the entire momentum region Okay, let's say this is entire entire momentum space then r1 could be filling this entire momentum space r2 could also be filling this entire momentum space meaning i will be counting all those e all those events in which one of the particle has whatever momentum another particle has whatever momentum and so forth okay so i i count all of them as the right events for which i am trying to find out the probability okay but let's not do that for a moment for a moment i make an assumption that not an assumption i am looking at an probability of an event a probability of a final, producing a final state in which the the particles have momenta lying in range uh, have particles uh, lying uh, have momenta lying in range r1 in a region r1 which is locate and p1 is one of the momenta within this region and let's say you have another region where you have momentum p2 okay uh, inside it and there is some some region given and and like that okay so that's what we want to ask an assumption is one assumption i make is that r1 r2 r3 and all of these okay they are there is no overlap between these regions okay that's an assumption i make for now but we can relax that assumption there is no need to so for a moment i'll just make this assumption so r1 r2 and all of an rn they do not overlap okay and i want to ask the probability of producing such a final state so probability which will be a function of among many other things a function of b okay and remember what is b b is the location of this particle okay so it will depend on this right see if if you take b to be 
to have a magnitude very large so suppose you have a particle somewhere here then the probability of collision of this guy with that guy will be small because it will have a wave function which will be localized around here and this guy will have a wave function when it uh, which when it reaches close to the to the sent uh, to the origin it will have wave function localized around here and there is not much overlap okay so the probability of them scattering and giving some final state which is different from having the same this particle and that particle will be very low okay so probability will depend on on b okay as you move away from from the origin the probability of uh, a non trivial scattering becomes small so you have a b dependence that's what i'm uh, making explicit so the probability of producing this final state when you have a scattering with a particle located at b is given by um, f1 b f2 that in state and then i'm producing this final state i should mod square okay and then i have to integrate over this entire region r1 and r2 and so forth so i have i should have um, okay let's see d cube pi over 2 omega pi and region ri and then i should take product okay okay i don't like writing it this way so i'll write it again the same thing i'm just repeating d q p1 over 2 omega p1 um this correct d cube p2 2 omega p2 d q p n 2 omega p n r n times So, okay, and uh, you should convince yourself that this is the right factor that you should have. You should have 1 over 2 omega p1, okay, and uh, this you should be able to argue based on the normalizations that we have used. Okay, so. Okay. So for now, this is assumption for now. Yeah, and with this assumption in place, this is the uh, uh, probability. Okay, for producing this final state. Okay, and what will be the sorry? This is the probability of producing this final state when you are looking at a collision with the particle located at b but if you are if you now ask the what is the probability of producing that final state when this particle collides with any of these particles in the in the beam then that probability is just the sum of all the above probabilities okay so that's what you should do now let's assume that okay before that i should uh, d cube b so let's say you have a density um, a volume density rho b okay so that gives you the number of particles per unit volume and then that's d cube b is volume okay volume element so i integrate over all of them and then i'm integrating this probability um, multiplied with this density okay so now I'm, I'm going to get the probability p of producing the final state. 
So I'll make an assumption that um, rho of b is a constant. Okay, so that I don't have to worry about the b dependence of the the density. Okay, so I'm just assuming that this is a constant. And there's another assumption that I should make. So imagine um, what will happen typically. So you have a, um, a particle coming with enormous amount of energy. It collides with one of the particles in the slab in this in this beam. Okay, and it produces lots of final state particles because the energy is very large of the incoming particle. Okay, it will produce final state particles which will also have large energy. Okay. So let's say it's what happened. Let's say what happens is that this is the thickness. This is of the beam, and it collides with a particle which is really on the surface of this this beam. Okay, this slab. It produces final state particles which are coming out with large energy, and these particles that then collide with other particles in the beam. Okay, and they produce some other final state because it's a different collision. It will have some different final state. and then they may collide with the remaining particles now that becomes difficult now now we are not the probability you calculate using this is not going to give you what is happening in 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 the experiment in that case okay where these other collisions are also possible so we assume that such collisions are not possible they do not happen or their contribution is very minimal okay meaning once a collision has happened with one of the particles in the beam whatever comes out goes to the detector okay basically that is the assumption and we can assume assume uh, we can make this assumption if we let the thickness of the beam to be very small okay so that we reduce the probability of the secondary uh, scatterings okay so we assume that the thickness of this beam is small of the beam is small so that we can neglect any um secondary scatterings okay because that will uh because if you do not make that assumption then what you are calculating here will not match with the experiment okay because this will be two very different things so we we let it to be very thin only um one particle collides once and that that final state is what is seen in the detectors okay so once we have made that assumption then in equations it means that p of b is basically p of b perpendicular okay and it does not depend on b3 okay just a second okay so that's the assumption of small thickness which is what i will now denote as b perp okay so this does not depend on bz on b3 okay and if you were to think what will happen if you had really thick beam then most of the time what will happen is these collisions will produce final state and nothing will come out eventually okay so you will not get anything outside 